Welcome to Stories from the Park, a Heritage Park podcast. Hi, I'm Kasaya Quill, Chief Curator. And I'm Dominic Terry, Communications Manager. Heritage Park is located on Treaty 7 land in Calgary, Alberta, a place where Indigenous people proudly share their history, traditions, stories, and attachment to this land. Today, we're talking about the Jewish Festival of Light, Hanukkah. We'll learn about the origins, traditions, and the fun and interactive experiences you can have at Heritage Park at the Little Synagogue on the Prairie. Our guests today are Leslie Levant and Irina Karschenbaum, both longtime interpreters at Heritage Park Historical Village. Thank you, Leslie and Irina, so much for joining us today. We're really excited to learn all about Hanukkah. Well, thank you for uh, for inviting us. We're happy to be here. Yeah, so, you know, when we, uh, if, uh, if people don't know, Irina and Leslie, very uh, kind of heavy hitters at Heritage Park when it comes to Little Synagogue on the Prairie. And uh, um, yeah, uh, Irina just flexed her muscles there. I know you can't see it, but it's... Uh, Good for everybody to know that uh, you know we uh, we we tell this great story uh, at the park, and uh, hopefully we'll continue. If next year is uh, I'm told our 15th anniversary of the little synagogue, so really happy to have you guys here. We're talking about Hanukkah. Uh, you know, guys, all cultures, religions have some sort of celebration that they have. Um, you know, during the holiday season. Why don't you tell us about Hanukkah and and kind of start from the beginning, its origins and, and how it sort of began? Well, I'm happy to tell you this story. Um, Jews have lived in the land of Israel for over 3,000 years. And this land is located on strategic trade routes. So it has been conquered by lots of superpowers who have interests in this particular area. So Hanukkah commemorates a historical event that took place in Jerusalem in the 2nd century BCE. And uh, it was when the Seleucid Greeks, who were the Macedonians, were in control of, they were the ruling power. So in 168 BC, that's like almost 2,500 years ago, a new emperor arose Antiochus IV, who called himself Epiphanus, and he uh, decided that everybody in that whole area should be Greek in every sense of the word, not just culturally and socially, but religiously. And so he outlawed Jewish practice and actually forbade it to occur. And it's really interesting because the other Macedonian who was very famous, Alexander the Great, 336 B.C., one of my favorite um, people of all times was a great friend of the Jews and allowed the Jewish people to continue their Jewish practices. And they so admired and loved Alexander that Alexander, a Greek name, is a very well-used Jewish name. It's not Jewish at all. This We are remembering Alexander the Great. So we have another Macedonian this gentleman, uh, Antiochus IV, and what he did is he went to Jerusalem, he went to the temple, he destroyed the artifacts, and he in he installed statues of Zeus, the, the premier god, and they did sacrifices with pigs. So this was a, a really a crucial difference between Jewish faith and pagan faith that, uh, you know, the Greeks had many gods. I'm sure you could probably name 10 of them right now. I'll just give you Zeus. <laughs> There's a, you know, Apollo, lots of these uh, idols. And they were an important part of Greek religious life. So this was a very big problem for the Jewish population to have all their practices and their customs and their actual study of Bible to be uh, prohibited. Mm. And the army uh, was sent out to make sure that everybody followed these rules. So a small army of Jews under a priest, uh, the Maccabees, uh, waged a guerrilla warfare over a three-year period against the, the Greek forces. Now, I don't know if you have any idea the, the power of the Greek army at that moment in time. Um, Alexander's father, Philip, invented the phalanx. It's 256 soldiers marching in a cube formation with the, the spear that he invented, his father invented a, a six meter spear. 
So you would be six meters away from your enemy. Uh, this was, uh, this was one of the, of the military strategies they used. They also had elephants which they got because Alexander went to India. He didn't just go to India. He conquered India. And he got elephants from India. And they are in the arsenal. They were in the arsenal of the Greeks at that moment in time. So this little band of fighters uh, against this huge army, what could they do? It was guerrilla warfare. And in the end, after three years of this kind of fighting, they won their freedom. They went to the temple. It was a big mess. They cleaned it up, and they only have found enough oil to last for one night. And the miracle was it lasted for eight nights, which is the exact amount of time it takes to make a new batch of oil from the, the Mediterranean area, famous for its olive oil. Mm -hmm. So we celebrate Hanukkah by uh, lighting candles, one the first night, two the second night, until we have eight the on the final night and there's a, a special candelabra that we use it's called a hanukia it's got eight places placeholders and one in the middle the servant candle that lights them all and so what do we do we eat oily foods and we eat like hanukkah we eat latkes potato pancakes we um light the menorah the hanukia we play dreidel games and the dreidel game is um, one of the fun things that everybody loves to do at Heritage Park is this little spinning top. And its origins are Greek in in origin. Uh, when the Greek soldiers came to uh, see if everybody was following the law and not carrying out Jewish practices, Jewish people would be studying in caves or in forests. And if they saw the soldiers coming, they would hide their books and pull out this little spinning top and just make like they were goofing off playing a <laughs> gambling game so we are still playing this game today very cool that's great so it sounds like a a, a great celebration of uh, a real um, important event in the history of the jewish people are there certain days out of that eight days that are more important than other days I don't think so. I think they're all just an opportunity to uh, family to get together and friends to get together and eat these potato pancakes, which we have recipes for. Oh, they're food. so good. Yeah, <laughs> people delicious. like to uh, to make them. Um, and uh, no, all the days are are the same. And it was interesting is that we use candles, but there are people who buy little olive oil um, individual things that they put in the candelabra and it very makes it sort of very authentic to the time and place. Yes. And uh, just to kind of add to what Leslie was saying about how all the days are the same. Uh, I'm here uh, showing uh, Hanukkah. This is my own Hanukkah. Um, I saw this Hanukkah when I was in Jerusalem many years ago in the summer of 1995, and I saw this uh, beautiful Hanukkah, which uh, looks like um, uh, the Kotel um, uh, in, in Jerusalem, I was walking there with my cousin in the old city, uh, and I saw this Hanukkah, and I absolutely loved it, but it was expensive, and I, uh, and I left. And then a few months later, this box arrives, uh, in my house, uh, here in Calgary, and my cousin went ahead and bought this Hanukkah for me, uh, and, uh, mailed it to me. Uh, but what our, uh, listeners can't see is all the candles are the same. Mm -hmm. And actually, um, to Leslie's point, um, you, uh, they're all on the same level, and it's to symbolize how all all the days are the same, oh. except for this one candle uh, here, which is raised, which is the shamash. And we use the shamash, the, the servant or the helper candle, to light the other candles on each night of the festival. Oh. Uh, and that tradition was made about 2,000 years ago. We had two rabbis, two two great sages. One was Hillel, and one was Shammai. And of course, as everything in Judaism, there's multiple uh, multiple opinions and how to do things. Mm 
Mm. (laughs) It isn't just one opinion. Uh, That would not be Jewish. (laughs) You know, as we say, uh, two Jews, three opinions. (laughs) (laughs) But so the two... The two rabbis, so uh, the which is known as House of Shammai, his what he thought uh, we should be doing is lighting the candles, lighting eight candles. So on the first night you light eight candles, on the second night you light just seven candles. Mm. Oh, I see. Okay. On, On the last night, on the eighth night, you only have one candle lit. The House of Hillel, the 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 great Hillel rabbi scholar, he had an opposing opinion. His opinion was that on the first night you light the first candle, well you light the shamash, and with the shamash you light the first candle, and on the second night you light two candles, mm. uh, and on the eighth night you will have eight candles lit. And the reason for that was that the magnitude of the miracle grew with time because um, at, at the beginning, we, there was only a tiny bit of oil and they only thought the oil would last a very short period of time. They never thought that it would last eight days. So Rabbi Hillel, he thought the magnitude of the miracle increased with time. And it was his opinion that won out for for Jewish customs and practices. Well, that's super interesting. Um, just to just to explain a little bit what you, what else you're holding in your hand there, uh, Irina. The you said the kotel. It looks like a brick facade on the back of it. Just explain what the kotel is. Uh, the kotel is uh, it's the western wall or the the wailing wall uh, in Jerusalem, which was. Is it the, the, it's the second, the, the surviving wall of the second temple. Mm-hmm. Yeah, very cool. And it's considered the holiest site in all of Judaism. Mm-hmm. Am I correct, Leslie? Today? Yes. And, and it's also interesting. Um, really, the, we have done the same traditions for forever and ever. Lighting the candles, playing the dreidel, eating the uh, latkes. But uh, your experience, Irina, as a child was very different. Um, yes, thank you. Thank you for that. Well, I'm, I'm originally from the Soviet Union. Uh, mm. I was born in the Soviet Union, uh, which is now Soviet Ukraine and Eastern Ukraine. And so by the time I was born, which is in the 70s, there was no Judaism. Uh, there were no Jewish practices or not in anyone. I mean, I was, uh, grew up in a Jewish family surrounded by Jewish neighbors. Um, our, our city of Kharkov, uh, at one point before the Second World War, uh, in the 1920s and 30s, one third of the population of the city of about 900,000, one third was Jewish. Mm. There were about 300,000 Jews in Kharkov before the Second World War. And um, it's remarkable because we don't have a city in Cal- in Canada with a, pop- with a Jewish population of 300,000. The largest population is Toronto, maybe about 180,000. And this, is, this was a real seat of of Jewish life was Ukraine, uh, Poland, Ukraine. But by the time I was born, there, there was there there was no Jewish practices. It was it was killed by Stalin and uh, it was killed in the Holocaust by Hitler. So so this is not something I grew up with. And a lot of Jewish people um, did not have these these practices uh, until we came to Canada and and we have slowly, s- slowly over many years, uh, have started to rebuild our Jewish life. Leslie and I, we've not actually known each other. I don't know if Leslie even realizes this, but for 45 years. Wow. Yes. <laughs> yes. Through uh, our children. Yeah, this is, um, this so is very are... moving. This is very moving that... Um, because of the war, the Second World War, we lost a third of our population. And so 
we haven't recovered it even as yet. So we are, we are living in the most wonderful country where we have freedom of, uh, religion, freedom not to, freedom to believe, freedom not to believe, uh, total freedom and freedom of conscience, the first freedom from which everything else devolves. And we do not often tend to think about how, how fortunate we are. Mm-hmm. That in this moment of time, when uh, all kinds of things are falling apart, we still have freedom. Yeah. It's, it's very, very special. And I, I like to talk about that, but I tell the story of Hanukkah, uh, because there are a lot of people of faith, and there are a lot of people of no faith, but they we need to appreciate that we uh, are free to uh, follow uh, our our heart yeah. these things. Mm. Hanukkah definitely could make those connections based on the history you just told us. Um, to bring it back a bit more into what you do on Hanukkah, um, there we understand there's a gift exchange, kind of not like Christmas, but like Christmas, there are gifts. But can you explain a little bit more about how Hanukkah gifts are given and what that practice is? Yes. Well, the, we yeah, have this discussion. I just want to just jump in. Yes. Um, You know, at the beginning, Dominic mentioned we have sort of a a holiday season. Uh, In terms of Hanukkah, Mm -hmm. I think it's entirely coincidence. Like our our holiday season is really September, October. Yes. For for the the high holidays, the Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur. uh, those are our main holidays, and Hanukkah is more of a minor holiday, although the message is very powerful. Mm-hmm. So sorry, Leslie. Well, going yes, back thank you. you for that. That is really interesting. This is called a minor holiday, not because it's it's minor in consequence, because it's not in the Bible. Mm-hmm. It's not like the story of Passover. It's not like the giving of the Ten Commandments. It's not not that, but it's still important. So that's a, 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 a thing to think about that it's considered lesser because it's not in the bible but what we do we do some terrific things at at the synagogue at heritage park it's lots of fun to be there first of all it's because it's very relaxed everybody's relaxed they're feeling in a good mood they have time and we do storytelling we do crafts uh we sing songs and we play dreidel Mm -hmm. and we also give out chocolate coins so that's very nice. Uh, and the crafts are lots of fun. We do we do stories and dreidel on Saturdays. And on Sundays, we do crafts and stories of dreidel. We have wonderful crafts. Um, we have my very favorite. It's a latka flip. And it's a little of uh, you're flipping this latka on a plate. And it's lots of fun. And the children really like to stay and relax and play. They stay a long time. They enjoy just having time to be a child. Mm-hmm. And within to that, obviously, a lot of fun uh, here at the park, and we can get into a little bit more of that uh, as you guys are getting ready for, you know, our, our holiday season here, uh, our holiday celebration. Um, but within families, the eight days of of Hanukkah, kind of explain how, how that goes. I know you eat the explain the, the, the evening process of it. OK, so we. uh we were just talking about presents. So it's Hanukkah gelt. Gelt means money. And so we would give children uh, chocolate coins or we'd give them money. Um, some children get gifts. It's not, it's not a Jewish Christmas. It's no. an entirely different holiday that's at least 200 years before the common era. Mm-hmm. So um, Hanukkah gelt was money was actually originally intended for the parents to give money to the teachers who taught with um, a lot of uh, passion and commitment. And now we just have Hanukkah Gelt. We light the candles. We hey, sing for, but, but Leslie, you were telling me the story that the Gelt, the money, was given to the teachers. Yes. The teachers were poorly paid. Right. And so that originally was where the money went. And children get gifts. I don't know if they get gifts, gifts every night. It's not... It's not in my tradition, but I guess some people do. Uh, we light the candles. We watch them as they um, they wind down. And that's when we play dreidel. The light of the candles is actually not for work. It's just to enjoy, to play dreidel, to visit. It's not actually to 
to cook or sew or, or mm-hmm. not to use that light in any other way, but just to enjoy it. You're so, supposed to rest while uh, rest and contemplate and think about the meaning of this holiday while the candles are lit. Um, you're you're not filling the dishwasher, <laughs> you know, <laughs> dirty yeah. dishes at this point. Yes, and there there and then it's another thing that we do. Sometimes we have questions, you know, in every building. I don't know what will happen this year, but one of the questions is how many candles do we actually consume? over the eight days and it's a mathematical question and it's interesting watching children using their fingers and counting uh, it's not higher math but it's a challenging question how many candles do we light but um yes so we that time is just to contemplate the story it's a wonderful story of uh, as it said in in our um in our telling of the story the weak uh uh over the strong, the few over the many, and the the miracle of our having regained our religious freedom. Um, so you talked a little bit about traditional foods. Um, are there things like decorations and foods and games? We've talked about dreidel. Are there other things that you want to mention related to the holiday that are fun yeah. and Delicious. Yes, well, thank you. Yes, we decorated. Irina came with me this year. We decorated. Everything is of the period. It's very much of the 19th. Uh, this building is 19. The settlement came in 1910. It finally wound up in 1927. That's our period. And everything is paper or mm-hmm. crayons or we have uh, dreidels and we have mug and dovids and we have we decorate um today people would use foil and glitter and things like that but we are very uh, faithful to the tradition of homemade largely paper and crayon mm-hmm. yeah, we're, to, we're time appropriate and the children they really love that mm-hmm. they uh this is a very popular time for the synagogue mm-hmm. uh our synagogue is usually packed with guests and kids, they go crazy over our crafts table. It's usually, um, it, they're there standing shoulder to shoulder doing the different crafts. Um, they don't want to leave. And and the children, they seem to really love the simple things. And they love the dreidel game. I think this it's is, this really interesting is a lot of our visitors, you know, they come, families come grandparents and parents Mm -hmm. and I'm always uh, amazed at how many people have farm roots Mm -hmm. because this was a prairie farming synagogue for Mm -hmm. pioneers who came uh, from far away and they were farming around the civil area civil on the border with Saskatchewan and so it's it's also fun to talk about what farming was like what life was like on the farm for these pioneers very challenging and lots of people remember from their grandparents or their parents. I think that there's a message there, guys, about understanding, and I think that Heritage Park tries to lean into this as much as we can, about understanding different cultures. And, and you know, you say that, you know, it's a, it's a really um, popular place during that time. Just, I guess, speak to, you know, the kinds of things that people will learn there that they wouldn't, uh, you know, that they wouldn't know. I know we're going to talk about the synagogue and its history and that kind of thing and its anniversary. But just talk about from your guys' point of view, and I, I think it's kind of a prescient time right now to understand other people's cultures and, um, you know, especially, you know, what you guys try to try to impart to young people and families when they come to the synagogue. Um, when I started to work on the project, this is what I wanted to do, was I wanted to tell this story and it was especially important to me because as I was mentioning earlier I come from the Soviet Union where they try to remove not just Jewish practices but all religion all religious practices were removed and and taken away from society and that's actually I don't think that's a natural state for the way humans are wired we have um, we have in us some kind of a spark where we're just naturally we naturally gravitate to some kind of religious practice or some kind of belief, some kind of a desire for meaning. 
which comes to us in our religious traditions, whatever that tradition is. Um, but when I started working on the project, I wanted to include that chapter of Alberta history, the Jewish chapter, uh, into the historical narrative of our city, of, uh, of our province. Uh, I wanted to talk about the importance of, of cultural diversity, religious diversity, and I wanted to do it through telling the Jewish story, which I think mm. has uh, enriched Heritage Park and the story that Heritage Park tells. Um, and, and it helps our visitors to understand that we had a multitude of religious traditions here. Uh, in our our province and a, a multitude of 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 cultures uh, that have helped in the in creating the vibrancy uh, of our province and that's ultimately what makes uh, Calgary and Alberta and Canada so interesting is that we have so we have multiple religions we we respect uh, differences of religious practices and religious opinions here. Mm -hmm. We're, we're a homogeneous society. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's great. The other thing that's really interesting, this, there's two parts. Our guests often, um, give us an education. We learn mm -hmm. from our guests. We learn about parallel societies. Similar mm -hmm. societies from from where our people or, originated. The other thing is, it's an opportunity for our guests to ask questions. They could be cultural, they could be religious, they could be custom tradition, and it's uh, we have a wonderful cohort of volunteers with a vast variety of backgrounds, and these questions are able to be answered. And it's a nice opportunity for people to have to ask questions in a very uh, warm and safe environment. And um, it's, it's really interesting that people come and uh, tell us things about their background and tell mm -hmm. us about their experiences. And it's, it's, it's lovely. Mm -hmm. And, and what's interesting, I've been an interpreter for, I think 12 years now, uh, is that the majority of our guests have never been inside a synagogue. Yeah, that, that is that is fascinating. Mm -hmm. Never been inside a synagogue. Um, that it, it, to them it is you know something fr from another world. It, it is a it, it is a culture that is um, you know it's a Judaism is a closed culture. And so the synagogue provides an opportunity for people to come and learn in a safe and comfortable, beautiful space and ask questions they may not have had an opportunity to ask. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I wanted to touch on one other thing and we have, don't have a ton of time, but I wanted to, there's, I grew up as Catholic and, um, and Kasaya has a, a totally different view on, uh, mm -hmm. uh, on religion growing up in, in the Christian faith. But um, I, I wonder about your, ideas about the parallels between these stories so the in the catholic faith based on a miracle right the birth of jesus light in the advent in the advent wreath mm -hmm. that that uh, that that catholic people light what's your what's your thought on on those two kind of intersections of the miracle and and the story of light oh the story of light it's like light and darkness mm -hmm. it's like forces of good uh in this particular story it's a pagan pre presence of multi divinities. Mm -hmm. And so there's um light is education. Light is understanding. Light is peace. What is darkness? Darkness means lots of things. It could be violence. It could be uh, hatred. It could be intolerance. But light is, is interesting in the middle of winter as well. We need light in the middle of winter. What is what does that light mean? What does it mean to you, Dominic? Yeah, so it, uh, it's not a it's not a daily practice in the uh, in the Catholic faith to to light the candle. It's a weekly thing on Sunday every 
the, the four weeks of Advent lead up to the white candle in the middle, three purple candles. The fourth is the pink candle. That is the that last week before Christmas. Uh, and then the white candle gets lit on Christmas Day. So it is, it's, uh, it's lighting the way towards, you know, the miracle of, uh, of, of Catholicism, right? Of, of the birth of Jesus. So it's, it's interesting. I just find it interesting that there, two of them are built off a miracle, yours being the miracle of, uh, you know, the oil that lasts for the eight days. Uh, the light uh, and the miracle of of the birth of Jesus, and then and then that the two are marked by lighting candles and the and the light that leads the way for the religion. So I just thought I just thought it was interesting. I wanted to get your perspective on it. Yes, no, I believe um, the original menorah. I'm sorry, who wanted to speak? Uh, well, uh, I'll just say that of course Christianity comes from Judaism, uh, and that of course. Jesus was Jewish mm-hmm. and um, it's uh, in Christianity it is celebrated that uh, he was born on December 25th mm-hmm. and and then January 1st is New Year's Day and I believe that counts as eight days is that uh, is there like um Something like that is mm-hmm. it that's interesting, yeah. Yeah, eight days. So in Judaism, on the eighth day, when a, a Jewish boy is born, that is when he's circumcised. Mm. Interesting. Yeah, there's um, all kinds of parallels there's across. So many it great, me. great parallels. We could probably talk forever about all of them. Um, maybe yes. we will one day. Uh, but we're going to wrap up now and say thank you so very much for coming to talk with us today about Hanukkah. Uh, we greatly appreciate it and are excited to have you both out at the park for our um, holiday event. And we'll be excited to learn more from you there. Thank you. Thanks a lot, guys. Thank you so much. I, thank you for this opportunity. And uh, we look forward to to the guests that come through the little synagogue of this once upon a Christmas and Hanukkah 2 season. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, guys.